Our panel tonight is entitled The Coming Displacement, Black and Brown Entrepreneurship in the Legal Cannabis Industry. So everything me and Lenise were just saying, that's the context for the title and the content of um, our panel. So I'll start by introducing our moderator, Charles Phillips, who's one of our most active board members and advisors at this point. He's really been helping us like with our strategic vision and just looking at where do we want this organization to be two, five, ten years down the line and helping us to shape that. So we're very grateful to have Charles um, with us in our organization and he's been helping our fellows get in shape. The fellows can attest to that. So. Um, a little bit about Charles. Charles Phillips is a sales, marketing, and operations executive with deep experience leading a variety of both startups and established firms, mostly in the areas of software, telecom, and professional services. Most recently, he was the CEO of Industrial Water Treatment Solutions, which he co-founded in 2011. That company provides integrated water treatment solutions to companies and cities around the world, really with the goal of creating a safer and more sustainable world by improving water quality for folks everywhere. Before that, Charles was a VP at Probitas Partners, which basically, it was a lot of complex financial stuff, but they do international <laughs> investment. He knows shit. <laughs> okay. And then before that, in 2004, he founded another company and served as the CEO of Terreo Enterprises, um, which was a project management and finance company that helped perform emergency infrastructure development, which is basically like evacuee housing after Hurricane Katrina. Um, and then before that, he was the COO of a Turkish American partnership that worked in the Middle East and did over $10 million of delivery of goods and services in that region. And his background, Charles went to Harvard, got his undergrad degree in government, and then got his MBA from Stanford. So this is our wonderful board member and moderator for tonight's panel, Charles, and I'll turn it over to you. Let's give him a <laughs> chance. I appreciate that. There's a massive, massive disclaimer which is currently I'm consulting for Harborside. Oh, right. 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 What I can tell you definitively, which is why I'm sort of leading this panel, is that no matter what you may believe, the Vikings are at the gate for all of you. Yes. They're coming. Y'all make too much money. Yes. Even the ones of you who don't think you make any money make too much money. So I teach a class at Stanford Business School from time to time. It is among the banes of my existence, but I do it because I think it's the right thing to do. And I am in front of a lot of young people who are exceptionally motivated, exceptionally entitled, and have an enormous amount of connections. And the industry they want to get into the most is the cannabis industry. Now, all of you will look and say, well, I'm not helping them. They're not looking for your help. They're coming. So what you have been playing in is a side pool of a large ocean that has been closed off for decades. And you're fighting over the scraps that are found in that side pool. But meanwhile, somebody has breached the dam and the water's about to come in. So the question is, what are we gonna do? Now as a side qu question, and I've already mentioned this suggestion today, black and brown people have missed their hustle in this country. My kids are Jewish. I've seen how that, that group of people operates as a diaspora around the world. It is not how black and brown people operate. So what you will understand is that at the turn of the century, Jews were basically the lowest form of, 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 of American society. But they got their hustle. And so what they ended up with out of that hustle was they started with the numbers, they ended up with Goldman Sachs and Metro Goldman Meyer. Right? Okay. Right after them, it was the Irish. Potato eaters, bastards, call them what you may. They got their hustle. Now, most people don't know what they did during Prohibition, but everybody's heard of John F. Kennedy. His daddy was the biggest gangster in alcohol. 
Full stop. We've all seen The Godfather. Very funny. Ha, ha, ha. Those guys, in this situation, Andrew Cuomo is the governor of New York. Damn near president. Because that's the hustle. What all these people did is they used something illegal and then they were able to band together around it and convert it to actual real dollars. And in many situations, they were assisted by the fact that the industry they were in actually became legal. But they were positioned and they worked together. Our hustle was supposed to be heroin, I suppose. But what happened was we got screwed up because by the time it came for us, we got put in a situation where all of a sudden they had a lot of real information that they could use to track us from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. If Joe Candy screwed up in Canada, he could move to Mexico. Nobody knew who he was. That doesn't exist for us anymore. So the point that I'm asking this panel to help me elucidate is, you are going to lose your position unless you work together. So the question is, how do we work together? And I'm telling you, in the situation I sit in, I wear an enormous amount of polo and I'm exceptionally clean cut. And I may or may not know how to dab. <laughs> right? The money doesn't care. It prefers me. So what are we going to do? So I want to introduce our panel and then see if I can get them to answer some, some questions. But I appreciate all of y'all coming out here. And when I first got into this industry, I had no idea I was going to be doing this much work with anything remotely related to social justice. But it has been amazing. And I think it's useful, but I think you've got to look at it both from the standpoint of how can we help and you know, how can we develop enough of an economic infrastructure for ourselves to survive if we want to remain in this room. Uh, Nina Parks is sitting in front of me. I'm going to pretty much read what they've said because I don't know these people, all of them, and I can't vouch for but maybe two of them. Nina, <laughs> Nina is first and foremost an artist, and then she's a social entrepreneur. Born and raised in San Francisco, out here in California. Uh, she has an innate fascination for the concept of justice, and she wants to defend the right of people to grow and express themselves. Your early childhood, you were a case manager, you've been a community organizer, and you now own Mirage Medicinal. And that's your family's holistic cannabis lifestyle brand. Very impressive. Uh, you have a delivery service in San Francisco, and you curate a high-quality cannabis product that encourages creativity, wellness, and self-care. And you got access to this business after your brother was sent to Rikers, yep. which is really tough to hear, but that is a frequent origin story. Um, so basically, you also are involved with Supernova. You chair the committee for the California Growers Association, a committee for the California Growers Association, and you lead the California Cannabis Couriers Association here in the Bay Area. And you're trying to basically heal our community from the effects of the war on drugs. Mm -hmm. We're happy to have you here. You. Jesse Gordon is the owner of Panacea Valley Gardens. Uh, it's a medical cannabis cultivation center, and you're the co-founder of an award-winning dispensary in Portland, Oregon. Right up the road, but not really. Um, he's the co-founder and chairman of the Minority Cannabis Business Association. And this is the first nonprofit organization founded to create equal access and economic empowerment for cannabis businesses, their patients, and the communities most affected by the war on drugs. Uh, in, in 2016, he began development on Saints Cannabis, which is a vertically integrated cannabis campus that will house adult use, retail, cannabis lounge, indoor and greenhouse cultivation, processing, R&D operations, all on one flagship property in Portland, Oregon, which is very unusual for a black man in Portland, Oregon. Yeah, it's not many of us. <laughs> you can do a short version. I'm getting that's a long, that's a long. I'm sorry, bro. <laughs> uh, so, you know, he went to Florida State. He's from the South. He's a member of a rival fraternity of mine. He's got a lot of good stuff. We're gonna get. We're gonna get to Taryn. Taryn has the shortest. Uh, there it is. In fact, I'm not even sure I have it. It's at the bottom. It's on that same page with you. Well, this is just not the professional. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. Yeah. Taryn, Taryn is an Oakland native. And Taryn is the owner and operator of Oakland Extracts. And he's known to many, many people in this room. He is a D6 cannabis commissioner, and he's an activist. He is a board member of Oak Deck, which is nowhere listed on this. And he's generally a well-respected social activist here in the community. And he's also one of the better business people that I know locally and one of the first people that I met. So Taryn will tell us more about himself if he thinks we need to know it, but good man, well known, and much more of a cannabis enthusiast than I am. Fair enough? <laughs> all right, all right, I like that, I like that. So nobody wants to hear me anymore, thank God. 
but I do have some questions for our panel, and I'd like to ask each of these questions. And if you could take three to five minutes in turn to answer these questions, because we're going to cover about five of them, and we don't have a, an, an enormous amount of time. But there may be some follow-up questions based on these questions, and I'd like to give the audience an opportunity to ask questions after we're done. So the first question is, what matters more to you? And I'd like you guys to go in order if you could. What matters more, the social or the economic impact of cannabis legalization for people of color? Um, I'm an intersectionalist, so I see, I see a lot of things being able to intertwine with each other. And as far as I'm concerned, everything's running uh, on parallel tracks. Right, and there does need to be a merger of it all, especially because um, Prop 64 ran on a campaign saying that there was going to be social justice solutions for uh, what happened previously during Prohibition. Right, they said that there was going to be expungements. They said that there was going to be a lot of other things that aren't even being talked about as we move into legalization. They're just talking about business right now and um, all of the assembly bills. There's nothing in regards to social justice. So. Um, both of them need to run simultaneously as far as I'm concerned because that's what they promised with it in their campaign. And they commandeered a lot of our activists that are big prison ab um, abolitionists and all these other things to back the bill. Um, so I would like to see them not turn them into liars, you know, because I respect those people. Um, yeah, so as far as I'm concerned, both of those things are very, very important. I can expand on that more, but I know that we have a lot of questions to get through, and I'm sure I'll be able to answer some of those Hello, other things. Though, <laughs> if you had to choose one. I can't. You're going to have to. No. <laughs> <laughs> no I'm, an, I'm an intersectionist. I don't have to do anything, and I'm a middle class mixed kid, so I don't have to choose anything, so I'm yeah. all of that at once. <laughs> There's a whole lot packed in that. So, what do you got? Uh, you know, I've... I, I agree. I think we're in the one industry where um, one is going to automatically maximize the other. Uh, the more good and social good we can do in the community, the more the industry will grow because this is a large demographic of cannabis users, um, a lot of ideas, a lot of things that can take the industry and needs to take the industry to another level. Um, but also, uh, on the other side, of course, economic uh, opportunities and the ability to build new infrastructure in these communities with cannabis dollars to, um, to uh, put money towards expungement, to make differences in people's lives, um, differences that were caused by social justice issues. I mean, it very much is in, in, you know, intertwined. But I, I guess if I had to pick one, I would definitely say the economic um, piece is, is most important for us. There are generational re repercussions that have been caused by cannabis prohibition um, and I think the only way that we'll be able to truly combat that within our community is with generational wealth, you know, the ability to, to raise us up to another level to where uh, we do have the ability to give uh, other people jobs or to leave something for our family when we're gone as opposed to uh, leaving bills. So I, I would definitely say that the industry and the growth, um, the ability for it to make money uh, is the most important for us to access uh, in some way, whether it's ownership, employment, or by making sure that some of that money, like it's done in California and in Portland, is funneled uh, directly to the communities that have been targeted. I would say economic. Economic leads to long-term social justice changes. If you just have social justice changes and you don't have the money to back it up, it just came on someone else's whim. And then once their whim passes, the social justice passes with it. If we gain control of the economics of the situation, we can choose to make these decisions long-term because they're, they're invested in our, uh, or part of our community's interest. And so as long as we have economic control, we can control the social change. So my next question, I'll start with you, is, Taryn, do you view the participation of people of color in legal cannabis as a form of reparations? No. Um, every, basically every brown person suffered under the effects of slavery, or every brown person that like, is family descended from that, or, or every, every brown person, because even whether family descended from it or not, you kind of grew up in an environment where you, you under the weight of the assumptions and the, you know, the power of racism and all that kind of stuff. But not everyone is going to access the cannabis industry, and not, not everyone's going to access the benefits of the cannabis industry. So those that choose to be in the cannabis industry and pretend like this is reparations for all are going to insult a lot of people, and I want to have no interest in the cannabis industry, yet still feel the effects of slavery. 
So trying to overlay those two, I think, is a bad thing. And also, the, the, this the term reparations is so divisive in our culture, it's not going to really get the job done. Like, we're trying to gain economic control of an industry. And we start talking about reparations, and that just triggers something in them. Where, oh, they're victim, uh, they're crying, they're whining, they're begging. So, I mean, reparations are a conversation that need to be had, but I would have those as there's two separate things. Yeah, I, I agree with that. We had a Vice article that came out about our model policy um, that essentially is not about giving, I mean, from an MCBA standpoint, we don't think that there's a way to make an, an unfair policy, an unfair like process of deciding who gets a chance to get into an industry that you know has the ability to shake out on its own, that does not cause you know more children uh, using cannabis based on statistics, does not cause all these fear-based things that require us to try to limit this industry. Um, we don't think that that is going to help. So I mean, if you limit licenses, you try to control an industry, it's not good for the progression of the industry or for the people who want to get in. Because ultimately, when you have license limits, big money is going to find a way to make that you know make that happen. You know whether they need to structure it this way or that way. And I've had discussions about this. With, with money and with political favor, you know, a license system, no matter how objective you try to make it, is going to be infiltrated. So, you know, I, we don't think it's about asking for something extra. You know what I mean? We don't think it's about, hey, saying, hey, give us something that you don't give everyone else. We want an equal chance. I think that's the best way for us to get into the industry. You know, we want everyone to be able to get in, not just people who are ready right when you turn something in. You know, it takes a lot of time. So when you can do that, I think, and, and focus less on asking reparations, right? So you can be right or you can be effective. You know, if we want to claim reparations by the truest name of the word, then it is reparations in a sense, but only regarding tax appropriation, making sure that we can recognize and reconcile. That's what we say. We don't say reparations. We say recognize and reconcile. Vice loved to put that in our, in our article with reparations. We didn't say that. Um, but, but to recognize the issues and to reconcile it with this tax appropriation, essentially is the way that we see is that form otherwise we just want an equal chance you know we want an equal chance to get in we don't want we want to let the market shake out we want to stop using these fear-based tactics to limit this business um and, and and prevent people from getting a chance to get in if they're truly passionate if i would have been in a number of different states i would have never gotten a chance to get into the cannabis industry because of my record because of the amount of money that i had when i got in all these different things and and i, I feel like we can provide product that is better than anybody in the state. I think anybody in the country, that's what we believe in. So um, it shouldn't take that in order to get into the cannabis industry and provide a safe product that, that helps people. Can you repeat the original question? Yeah, do you view the participation of people of color in legal cannabis as a form of reparations? No, I don't because this is a business, right? And if you feel in business that anything is owed to you, you're dead in the water mm -hmm. already. Right, then you have no grit, no resilience to be in this space. So if you feel like anything is owed to you to be in this industry, mm. that's a joke. Mm. So it, like you either like put on your big girl pants, big boy pants, and you get out there and you get what's yours, or you get left behind. And that's the real, you know, like long and short of it. You know? That's real. Well, that leads to the next question, which is, who do you feel would be more effective in including people of color? in the cannabis revolution, will it be the business community or government entities? Because what I'm hearing, you all seem to have a fairly conservative bent about this, where you just don't feel like there's much need for a push for people of color, but that the market should play out. I think we all would like to see some regulations set up that, that assist people who are having trouble accessing the capital to get, get open these businesses to open these businesses. But I think we're just all realistic about the fact that you can't expect this culture to like continue to try to help you over a long period of time. Like we can, there's something nice can be set up now, it's just not gonna necessarily last. And if you kind of, if your whole business model is predicated on the idea that other people are concerned about your well-being and that there is this social justice model that these other people are kind of gonna follow, you're probably gonna fail. But do we believe that there's those things need to be set up? Yes, I mean, on one way or the other, I'm sure we all believe in some kind of equity program. Like we want things like that to exist, but we just don't want to expect have people to rely on it. You can't rely on other people. You gotta be willing to, you know, like she's saying, you gotta have some grit. You gotta be willing to fight through it. You can't expect these people to hand it to you. So. Yeah, no, I mean, really, we gotta have, I, I think low taxes makes more sense than having a higher tax to give to, to people, honestly. Um, I do have maybe more of a conservative regard. I, I don't. I think we should all be able to get in. You know, I don't think that we should be creating 
legislating business. I don't think it works. It works for the people who are able to legislate. So if we can be in every single legislative hall, every time they sit down and try to decide rules, and we can guarantee that we're gonna have a fair slot in that, then yeah, maybe let's go about that. But that's never gonna happen. You know, that's never happened in the history of this country, and I don't think we should expect it to happen in general. We need to ask for an open, a fair chance, lower the barriers in general, you know, um, require low taxes, low fees, just like any other business. Um, and I think we will see more of us getting involved, more of us with that entrepreneurial spirit that get in and actually have a chance to succeed. Because as she mentioned, when you get in the cannabis, it's not easy at all. You know, especially in some of these markets that are very big, you're going up against a lot of big players, you know? And she's, you know, pushing with her business. That is, I can imagine how difficult that is in a market like this and like San Francisco that's so mature. So, um, you know, I, I, I definitely, you know, I, I think that there should be a push more from businesses because it makes good business sense. That's the key. The key is not how can you give us something. The key is your business, your industry will never grow the way that it can. It will never be sustainable. You will never access the real true consumers if you don't take some of these things seriously, if you don't recognize and reconcile the issues that have been caused by cannabis prohibition then your business won't grow. You know, we want to show you that. We want to prove that to you. And by doing that, people will mo will definitely follow, you know, follow in. I think it's more true in this industry because of the history. So the more we band together, I think um, the business will see. And I think that's happened in a number of different places. Uh, people recognize this is an important issue. Um, and I think that's where we should have our push from a business perspective. Because, um, again, I don't think, you know, regulations are, are really going to gonna help us. Hmm. All right. This is funny because it speaks to what my daily life is like. Because I run um, wearing many hats daily. At one time, I'm running my business, right? So I have my small business owner hat on. And then the next minute, I have my um, working with a lobbyist to make sure that I'm written into the bill like hat on, right? So my business is delivery, right? We have no definition in any of these new regulations for my type of business. Mm. It's non-storefront delivery, I mean, non-storefront dispensary, right? The new regulations that came out, right? We've been, I don't know about you guys, but we've been knee deep in reading policy lately, right? And um, if that's not something that you guys are into, I definitely suggest that you find a friend that is <laughs> or start coming to Supernova meetings. We do have one at the end of this month. Um, May 25th, 25th, we'll give all the information to Lenise, she can send everything out to you guys. Um, but it's important, right? So, um, within those regulations, there's only definitions for a delivery employee, which to me is like a stab in the gut because I've been fighting to have this business over the past three years and I am not going to become an employee for somebody. Um, it's a... <laughs> So this is where things this is where I said it's a, both of these things are very intertwined because we need money, right? And that's we're gonna get that money through our businesses, right? And then we need a band together because no, no one business has enough money to be able to fund a lobbyist every month in order to ensure that we're gonna have our um, language that we need to make sure that we can survive in this industry written into it, right? So now what the Delivery Alliance is trying to do, or now it's the Courier Association names, it's all like, it's kind of like gangs, dude. All of these associations are like gang endorsers. Anyways, or Game of Thrones, whichever one. Um, but we're um, currently in the market to find a lobbyist to be able to construct language, to be able to push forward, right? And so we're having to band together with uh, delivery, um, delivery services from San Diego all the way to Sacramento. Um, that's going to be a fight and it's going to be a lot of uh, different places that we're gonna have to inject ourselves. There's a trailer, there's a budget trailer bill, also neglects to add our language in there um, in order to find money to ensure that we're gonna be okay. Um, and then there's one other piece of legislation that has our definition of non-storefront dispensary and that's the only thing that we're banking on and we saw how things played out last year with AB uh, 1575 and they just got tired of it because it was like so much packed into that bill that they just ended up throwing it away and this bill, um, AB 64 that's supposed to integrate uh, the medical and uh, uh, the recreational like framework is what this bill is and it also has a lot in it and that's the only thing that we're to bank on. We're not going to do that this time. We learned from last year we have to do something different this year. So um, 
both of them are really important, and both of them have to run simultaneously to ensure that social well, what justice you, what happens. You, what, what you seem to be highlighting, <laughs> right. and, and what you all are highlighting, is that these are really complex issues. Right. However, it can be very difficult for communities to coalesce around complex issues. Correct. Yes. So it's it a may challenge. seem as if there's an opportunity to highlight a couple of themes right. that will let the community coalesce around them. Right. So what you just described is horrendously complex. Right. But it's also very personal to you. Right. So you care about it at a level of granularity right. that may not make sense to the room. Totally. Oh, so here. Thank <laughs> you for bringing me back to center. Well, All right. right. So here. The thing is, delivery is important of a delivery is a very important piece of a, this other ecosystem that needs to exist within cannabis policy, right? That ensures small businesses have a playing field to even be on. Having delivery service also will allow for the small cultivator, the small um, like uh, edible manufacturer, topical manufacturer, um, dab maker, right? Um, all of those people to have an outlet. If we are written out and all those fees are put up so high because for the manufacturing licenses, right? If you're making 100K to like 250K, you have about 7.5% of your income that's going to be put to corporate tax. However, if you're a business that's making like Harborside that makes like 2 million a month, like whatever, a month, damn near, right? Like they're only going to have to pay like 1.5%, which is a fraction of what they make and therefore will continue to be able to sustain on, whereas the small business that has to pay 7.5% and allow for um, living wages and insurance and all these other things that for their workers and over, like overhead, it's going to make it very difficult for them to survive. So we're going to need to ensure that and like it highlight and bring that to the awareness of these lawmakers be like, we see you. This is fucked up. You can't keep creating these policies that keep on writing us out. We're not doing drug war 2.0. That's not why we're legalizing. Like, if you're going to make policy, you're going to address the fact that this was a racist policy to begin with, which means that you made all these laws to enforce communities to make us depressed and sad and not believe in ourselves and all these other things. They're not going to do that. To, like, they're not going to do that this time. We have a very unique opportunity, and you guys have amazing resources around you. So tap into all of them, and I know it's super complex, but there is a big glimmer of hope out there. And I think that's a perfect example of something that's good for the industry as a whole. Like having delivery services, right? We can see across everywhere where, where business is going in general, Uber, um, Postmates, delivery food, everything. That's where the world, that's where everyone is going. So to create a new industry and to say, try to, try to rule out delivery, or try to not allow small business, right, micro canopies, these small business licenses that have the ability to function and survive is not good for the industry as a whole. So I think we can always start there in my view. Whenever we see something that is hurting and what I've learned, whenever we see th something that affects people of lower socioeconomic backgrounds, small businesses, people of color in a negative way, it's negative for a new thriving industry that needs innovation. It needs new ideas in order to get over these different hurdles. It needs to understand these different cultures and different application methods that have different preferences based on your culture, based on your background, um, different ways to bring in new consumers. It's good for the community and it's good for the industry. So I always start there and say that it's not good for the industry in general. And I know that that is going to lead us to a place that is going to have us better because we have people who are very, very capable who have been running businesses, who are doing things better than other people have the ability to do it, who know the industry. That's something that we do have. A lot of us know the industry well. I know the industry. I know cannabis. She knows it, right? She's grown up with it. A lot of us know it by heart. So if you give her the ability to get into an industry and give her the chance to thrive, she will survive, right? If you give me, if you give all these people out here, the people who are pitching, the real chance to get in and give them the equal opportunity, they will rise to the top. Of course, without a doubt. I mean, tax appropriation, yes, right? It, it, has, it has to happen yeah, in every yes. single city, in every single municipality that legalizes cannabis. They have to. In the past, it's been an automatic to give money to the police. That's been an automatic, is that police get a certain amount of money. That needs to be flipped. An automatic needs to be you need to give money to these communities that have been targeted through cannabis prohibition. That is the automatic. Then we can talk about the other things, but that's first. And if that happens, 
I think that is one of the, 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 the biggest ways that we can see real uplift in our community is to put these dollars there so that first they can understand that the cannabis industry is doing good things and can do good things and then we as an industry can say that we actually did something that was worth it and we can look back in 20 years and 30 years and see how that made a difference in these communities as opposed to having these little basic programs and things that sound good that aren't implemented correctly that ultimately don't mean anything and that you know really just are in place to, to get a vote passed. Taryn? Um, I think I started off the answer initially. I, I agree that delivery is important. It's the lowest barrier of entry for people getting into retail. Mm -hmm. We need to protect those kind of avenues for people to get involved in it. Um, I think that we, it's, we can't rely on business to do the socially responsible thing, but we do need to focus on being business owners. We do want to try to influence policy and politics as well as we can, but we can't rely on that. But to, we, can't, we don't want to ignore that either. So we do need to be engaged politically as well as we're engaged in the economic side of things. So as much interest and focus as we have on building a good business plan, we should know who our local representative is. They should know our face. So we should kind of be involved on both ends. We should strive on both ends. But uh, neither, neither one side nor the other is going to save us. But I think us being good business people and focusing on the business side and coming together as business people and working together is extremely critical. And that's something that I don't see enough of. I see a lot of people trying to be politically engaged. I see a lot of people talking to the, the politically, being politically active, but I don't necessarily see as many people trying to come together with their small business as well as they could. Well, that, I mean, that leads to the next question. So when I, when I hear you, it feels like there's a synthesis, and I, I keep hearing this, it's sort of business needs to do this in conjunction with our pressure on the government. Yes. Is that reasonable to say? Yes. I think that, that my question is, how do you put the pressure on the government, which is the next question. And so, you know, a lot of other, situations, people engage in civil protest. You identify issues and then you, you march, you boycott, etc., to ensure participation. Do any of you have a view on that? I mean, the, so I'm sorry, politicians don't care about the interests of the coal companies because the coal miners are in the streets you know, waving flags or, or you know, picketing. They care about it because the actual coal industry applies financial pressure on them. So if we want something done by the politicians, it's not just about being in the streets protesting. It's us getting our money together and lobbying and putting pressure on those same politicians. We can't just go begging to them. We have to, like, you know, appeal to them with some force and force what politicians look like. So are you planets. suggesting that protests in the streets will not work? No, I'm case. suggesting that we need to be more focused on getting our money together and acting on that end because I think they're more responsive to money than they are to protest. We do need to have protest. We do need to have the activists actively involved. But as much as the activists are involved in the street, the people actually own the businesses need to come together, throw their money together, and be active on that front as well. No, you didn't cut me off at all. It was good. I mean, we have we have to understand how strong. I mean, everybody needs to understand how strong of a position we have right now in this industry. Look at the statistics. You know, like Lenise and everyone showed before, 19 to 1 arrests. There are politicians. Who do care? I mean, as much as I know we, we, we get run, you know, we get spun in the ringer and we really get frustrated a lot of times with the movement. But when you show a real politician, for example, Congressman Earl Blumenauer, and in California you got Damon, uh, Dana Rohrbacher, right? Now I'm not very familiar with him, but I know Congressman Blumenauer will reach out to me um, and say, hey, look, this is what we're thinking about at the, at the, at the Cannabis Caucus and at the national level. What do you think about this? How can we make this better? What do you think about expungement? All these things, right? He didn't have to reach out to me. Um, he's not necessarily dealing with a bunch of black voters in Oregon, you know what I mean, who are gonna, who are gonna vote him out of office. He's not going anywhere, you know? But he cares, and I think that we have to understand that, and I know, again, we have frustration with the white and the black and all that. I, I think from an MCBA perspective, since we started the organization, we've gotten so much assistance from, from white people, you know, from legislative officials. More at times than I wish we would have gotten from other, you know, people who I expected more assistance from. So we got to take that seriously and put them in a position where you simply, like I said, even in Portland, Oregon, the whitest city in America, metropolitan city in America, it's like almost a three to one arrest ratio of blacks to whites in the whitest city in America. When I go to City Hall and I sit down and I talk to the mayor or I talk to anyone, right, any of the commissioners, I say, hey, do you want to look at this? Look at the statistics, you know, and, and look compared to everyone else. Is this something that you're going to do? You're going to do something about this? Um, because we do have also a lot of media who really want to hear a lot of these stories. 
And yeah, they're looking for clickbait, right? They're looking for all these things, but we have to use these tools that other people have learned that move politicians. You know, negative headlines. People care about the cannabis industry. If you wanna know, if you can gather, if we can put something together and join together with all the organizations, everything that we're doing, and say that these are three issues that we wanna focus on, then we will find traction in that. And I, I've noticed that when I went by myself to City Hall and I didn't talk about MCBA and I didn't have that name behind me and see that there were people, and I'm sure you've seen that with Supernova yeah. as well, right? Mm -hmm. They, you know, yeah, you might talk to the chief of staff, but when they know that you're doing something, when they see a program, when they see that you're joining, they say, oh, oh, they're joining. They're, they're talking about, okay, let's, let's put it on the agenda. Yep. Let's figure out how to make it happen. Let's have that meeting. That's what we have to do. We have to use the same things that we've seen that have moved politicians. Money is the best one. Right, and I think we understand that. He's right, we need to organize businesses. But those are some of the other things that we can do now and really join together, uh, use some of this media attention and put pressure on some of these politicians. But we have to be at the table and we have to know what's going on. I applaud Supernova for what they're doing in, in Oakland and really being up on that. That's one of the best things that you can do, you know, is really be at the table, know what regulations are happening. I, my, my mind was turned when I saw that when you actually understand what's happening, you can present a good argument to the right people how you can make things happen and make changes so um, I think we have the ability we have the tools to do it uh, I think a lot of times also I don't want to go too long we get um, what I've noticed is we get a little excited sometimes you know like we get our businesses we get started and sometimes we get a little bit in the clouds right we, we get a lot of media attention right sometimes that works in a negative sense and we start thinking we can do it on our own or this is our chance right well, I can do it right as opposed to we can do it. And I think that more, once we start thinking more we can do it, we will see a lot of things change very quickly. I mean, seriously, it is, it's not a lost cause at all. This question is actually very personal to me. Um, I grew up in San Francisco and um, I started, okay, so before, before this lifetime incarnation as a delivery service owner, right, as a, in the cannabis industry, um, I started off as a community organizer. And part of community organizing is being able to get my community out, being able to educate and address issues. So um, protest was one of the greatest ways that we would be able to do that. Um, my main focus prior to all of this was on uh, police accountability because I was, the, I was the case manager and a um, site coordinator for a youth organization in San Francisco. That youth organization was targeted by the police on a regular basis where these uh, police officers would run in and like tear our kids out of, the, like, out of the center, sit them on the pavement with zip ties because they jaywalked, right? There was a huge issue there. I addressed that issue when we started protesting, right? We started like actively showing up and just like yelling outside of people's offices, right? But you know what? Nothing really happens there. We're just again, just like the angry people just saying what they need to say, right? Um, from there, I, I realized that what needed to happen and what always needs to happen is education, right? It's always education, so I chose to, instead of uh, exhausting all of my energy, although what it did do was spark a lot of other people within my community that were able to set, like, to step in and become more of the mass, right? Being able to stay outside of the offices and be able to put that pressure on, saying that the, like, the community knows that this is an issue, the community knows that we have to speak up. So the protest is important because it involves the community, it brings, it's an energy that it brings to the table. However, I noticed that I had to start going to people's offices, so I started going to the, meet with the police chief, meet with the captain, be able to figure out, hi, why is your officers over here running into my center and not talking to any of the adults that are here? Oh, you think that I'm not an adult, thanks, that's great. Um, however, I am in charge of these kids during this time period, so we're gonna have to figure out how you're not gonna traumatize them more, right? So. There was like policy that was created, although it wasn't implemented and all of that stuff, whatever. We, there's, I realized that there was a huge issue. So the other issue was that there was no money backing it. There was the, always the excuse, there's not enough money, there's no money in the budget. And I was like, oh, okay, whatever. When my brother went to jail, there was no amount of protesting and all that thing that was gonna help me. All I knew was that I needed to get the business running because we needed to get the money for us to be able to say, we are taxpayers, you're not putting my tax, 
to giving police officers t tasers. Sorry, no, we're gonna actually, you're gonna take that money mm -hmm. and you're going to do the CIT training, which is con um, crisis intervention training that you have not made mandatory for the entire police force, but you say that's there and you use that as a crutch saying that you're addressing the issue, but you're not, because it's not mandatory. So I realized that having the business and uh, pushing on that front um, is the other effective way, but like it wouldn't have happened without the protest also simultaneously. So um, again, intersectionality, intersectionality <laughs> is my like specialty, <laughs> and I know that's like a, and like the, and like the thing is is like the middle ground is where people go to die, you know. So um, <laughs> at this at this point, um, I'm realizing that um, business and us getting economic like power in order to make these changes is really, really, really the most effective thing. Education to our community and empowering them to continuously speak up, and that's usually through the protest, is also very important, but if we want to see long-term changes. Um, I'm half Filipino, half Jewish, by the way, so I can understand your Jewish analogy. Ashkenazi is important. Ashkenazi, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, uh, it's hard. Like, we need people out there in the street. We need the protesters. We need that. But we need even more now than ever. We need uh, people that are going to push on the economic level to be able to push on the, on the political level. You know what? Normally, I, I, I would have disagreed with you. you know, I mean, not disagree, but brought up a different, a different example of what's been happening in Portland is people have been trying to, um, or they've been showing up at the mayor's house and, you know, the outside his house, and then they want to get a meeting, you know, and that. Right, then he's not going to necessarily, right, they're going to try not to happen. But the cannabis industry doesn't happen without people protesting, right, without people making noise. I mean, even in Portland and Oregon, when you're in a legislative hall or whatnot, and you're talking about a new policy, you can almost see, um, you can almost see the legislators, the OLCC, whatever who it is, the commissioners, whenever people say um, the patients are going to going to go crazy over that, right? You can almost see people like, oh shit, we don't want to, we don't want to be patients out here outside of our door, you know? So, I mean, it does, it, you know, I, I, it does make a big difference. Um, it, it, it kind of, you know, it brings something to reality or something that's going to be a problem, right? And they need to handle it. Um, but also they thrive on us, or a lot of people thrive on us not knowing the system, you know, not knowing when the meeting's going to happen, not knowing um, when they're sitting down, you know? They love, I mean, they, they I, I, I promise they, they plan on it, you know, they, they don't think that we're going to organize, they think we're going to maybe talk, but they don't think we're going to be at the meeting and have the information that, that, that they need in order to make a decision. They really don't think it's going to happen. So when we do, um, I think it does make a difference, especially in this industry, when we have the history and the numbers behind us uh, to really make sure that we have a very, very strong, legitimate case. Well, I think that's what we got. Uh, we got a, a, about 10 more minutes. We'd like to have people ask a few questions. Are there any questions that you have for the panel? Anyone? Yes, sir. Um, so I'm wondering, what have, um, drawing from what you learned in communities where uh, prohibition has been you know, eased or reduced, what are some lessons that we can draw from the like, experience in these communities that can be used um, in places where prohibition is going to remain in effect for a, a while still in terms of empowering communities there and um, you know uh, so, sort of the stuff you guys are talking about about addressing policing and ending and ending aggressive policing or just kind of community organizing and, and cannabis as playing a role in that but in places where you know to be realistic prohibition is probably going to be around for quite a lot longer. So you're speaking of like other states yeah. that have um, Oh, it's a, it's a long journey, but education is always going to be at the forefront of it, right? So being even, even being able to go into, um, first off, taking on a really small scale, like on a really small scale, talking to your friends and family about like your own personal cannabis use, and then being able to get them to become advocates for you that builds your, your support center, because after you have your support center, you actually can have the ability to go out to do the other things. Because if you go out to do these other things, then I'm gonna say after this, it's gonna be very hard if you don't have your center of support, okay? So after that, you start to go talk to your legislators, right, which is also an exhausting process because you're, you're always gonna con like continue to repeat yourself over and over and over again. Um, and if it's a prohibition state, then you're gonna have to repeat yourself for years, 
Okay, and you can't get tired of the message, you have to always repeat the same message like it's brand new and you're still excited about it, even though yeah. you're not. Um, and that's where like your core group goes mm -hmm. to help you to gain that energy back to go out there and say that again. Squat up. <laughs> yep, exactly. Um, and then uh, for, from that point, like talk to teachers. Like, how do the teachers talk to their parents? Like, talk to um, talk to the counselors. How do they like educate the people in the school about it? How do they? How do college people like kids think about it? Go to the college campuses. Start talking to like the youth out there. Do they feel that this is a social justice issue? Is it a, um, a matter of economy? Like, it, so like talk to the different departments, right? Department heads, and be like, maybe we can just start this conversation. Let's uh, have a study like where these students look at. Colorado, Washington, and California, and everybody like studies the policies and or the economic development in those places, right? So education is always going to be the place that's going to help to create these avenues. Get to know your city council, and I would go talk to them not just about cannabis related issues. If you know they're not going to want to hear about cannabis for years, let them just get to know you as a concerned citizen. It seems like when I was going to the city council meetings before I got really involved in the cannabis thing, they knew people who came to the meetings all the time and they kind of responded and respected those citizens because they were conversed on a wide variety of issues. So if you're just the weed guy, you're just going to be the weed guy to them. But if you're someone who's been coming to city council meetings for years, who's been actively involved and curious about what's going on, when they actually start exploring that issue and when you speak up on it, they're going to be someone they actually want to hear from. You're not going to just be someone who might have some vested interest in the weed yet. So just get to know your, your politicians, get to know the city council, and be involved. Um, thank you guys for coming. I had a couple of questions. Uh, what, what kind of organizational structure are, are you guys using in your businesses? Because I heard the hard question, which I thought was really clear, economic or social justice. And have you thought about the idea of creating different business models that answer that, that question of what it looks like to have economic and social justice at that intersection. And what I'm referring to here is the cooperative model. And, and is that the style of business? Because that also allows us to glean and capture other folks who maybe would not be able to get into the industry, therefore helping to level the playing field. So my, I guess my question is like, how are you operating as a business? Because the thing is, what, what we understand is this top-down model really is just not a regenerative system. Um, and when we opened up, we talked about uh, who ran alcohol, who run policy, how business and things are affected, um, whose cousin runs this nonprofit and whose business writes off to that nonprofit every year for a tax reduction because we know that's how it works. My cousin runs this business and then I donate to the nonprofit mm -hmm. and then that's a tax write-off for me and then we keep the money going in the family on a continuous basis. So I guess the question is like, you know, it's very important, I think, the business aspect and we must move away really from the nonprofit pimping model um, and move into a different um, economic model because the economic model is the social justice, right? And so then I guess the question is, what are the economic models you're using in your organization right now? How are you operating? Is it uh, just, you know, top down? Are we looking at a more cooperative model where everyone is an owner? Well, we have a very small organization right now, so there's like three of us. Right, and so everybody has a, a stakehold and a piece of ownership with our very humble team. Um, as far as uh, uh, our business model, we work with other small businesses, so other uh, like uh, other cultivators that we relate to and share our value sets. Right, because right now we're really like in an infancy stage. Right, so I mean, literally at the end of the month, I have my my own invest investors pitch where we have. Um, potentially this venture capitalist company that's like, I don't know, former NBA players or whatever that I'm hoping to be able to fuel some, um, some energy, some money into what we have to even be able to figure out the next phase of what our actual business structure is going to evolve into. Um, but right now we're trying to get to the point where everybody eats and like, our small growers feed into our business, right? Our small manufacturers feed into our business, and everybody has a very symbiotic relationship with one another. If, will it turn into a co-op later when we try to go for our 10A licensing? Quite possibly, because that would be like cultivation and dish, like um, and retail sales, right? So we would have to have a greater cooperative model in order for us to actually run that um, in a way that is like stable. So um, I believe in the cooperative model. Um, it's not easy to get to. If you talk to anybody that has even worked at like Rainbow Grocery or anybody, it's a very um, like emotionally draining process. However, um, it is something that helps all people rise up in some kind of way. So we're 
working all that those pieces out, but we'll see what happens at the end of the month for us. Yeah, we have an S Corp and, and a C Corp as well. I haven't really looked much into cooperatives. Um, and we looked into B Corp where essentially some of that money is, you know, going to be going to nonprofit, but uh, we haven't made any moves because that essentially, I guess, opens your books up a lot more to the federal government, which I don't think we're in a position to take that risk right now. Um, so, you know, I, I think there's a lot more room to, to explore that, but we've kind of been on, on the typical structure. Uh, we don't have to be a nonprofit uh, from a medical standpoint in Oregon, so we've been doing our business for a couple of years. My business is extremely small. There's only a couple of us. Uh, as it gets bigger and as it grows, I, I like the values behind a co-op. But I go to a lot of meetings now where groups of people try to sit down and they can't order lunch. Right. So I've spent the past four years working about six or seven days a week on this business. I'm not giving up control to another group of people. I, I'm going to try to do my best to use, do whatever money we do make to use it responsibly. I think I pay anyone who works for me more than a lot of other people pay because when all a lot of other business people hear how much I pay, they think I'm silly. So I try to take care of the people around me to the best of my ability, and I believe in sharing in the sense of whenever I come, whenever I try to get together with other business entities, when we come upon business opportunities, I'm not trying to figure out how I can make the most money. I'm a big believer that if everyone at the table gets to eat, we're all going to eat more. So I, like, I kind of believe in those value systems, but am I going to make my business a co-op? I can't honestly say that. I can honestly say that I won't do that, but I'm, 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 I'm trying to live by those values. I trust. I appreciate you. Well, I think that's it. That is real. Thank you. I, mean, I, I appreciate everybody for being honest. <laughs> Good job.